Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Copix Reacts to Things. Have you ever made a decision that was terrible? Actually, maybe the worst. In fact, I'm probably on number 13 for the day. So, why not go for 14? I really have no idea how to start this video, but I really have to let you know about this show because I spent enough time in here that I it deserves content I would like to make absolutely zero dollars, which is why I would like to say that today's sponsor has sponsored me. Am sponsor. Get merch or something. I don't, I don't, I don't know, man. Do you like not not wearing clothes? Do you like drinking water? or other unspecified beverage, add over. So much like the video title suggests, I watched Yu-Gi-Oh! in 2024. I actually started watching it in 2023, and I watched many shows in between, because I needed, I needed a break, a couple of breaks. I've been told that Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and 5Ds are really where it's at, but what I watched were the five seasons, the 224 episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, all of the filler as well, which there is a lot. But I wanted to watch it because YouTubers that I love to watch have raved about this show being amazing. I, of course, watched it in the way that the good lord intended, the four kids dub. <laughs> And needless to say, I, I'm a big fan. Uh, I got the sweater for $69, lol. It says, Deck the Halls. Uh, yeah, I would have made this video sooner if I only had just finished it. I have been procrastinating this video, but you know. There's that, there's Deck the Halls. But you know, it's still not as good as Copic's merch. For those of you who don't know, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a show that came out in 2000 based off of a manga series, and it, is about a card game called Duel Monsters, and they have their own card game, of course, to go along with this. And of course, I do have a deck. It is not good at all. It is pre-built Blue Eyes White Dragon, again, the way the good lord intended. I also have Blue Eyes White Dragon and Seto Kaiba, greatest characters of all time. This show is, is whack. I tried to watch it in both English and Japanese, and Japanese, it was a fine show. It was fine, it was good. But the four kids dub just like elevated it to like a level of irony that was just, it made the show less of a slog to get through. I can say though that I am definitely not the target demographic for this show. But what I do have is I do have a, I have a little conspiracy theory. So I, I, want you to, I want you to listen in. I want you to listen, okay? Okay? I think that 4Kids Animation... Come closer, come closer. I think that 4Kids Animation... knows it's bad. And it is all ironic. It is all a joke. It is all possibly just so that the adults watching the show have fun. But I think that they are not... I think they are intentionally bad. There's no other way. There's no other way. This show is so, it's so cracked out of its mind. And not like in like a super crazy way, but it just, the, the absolute non-violence that there was in the 2000s. Because I didn't get to watch this as a kid. It's one of those things where I really am currently in the process of wanting to watch things that I didn't watch as a kid because we didn't have, I didn't have cable. I got Walmart cable when I was 13. That's about as good as it got. And I also grew up in the time period in the late 90s, early 2000s, where first time parents thought that Pokemon was short for pocket demons and it was unchristian-like, so you didn't get to watch it. And now I am obviously rebelling because my favorite show is Oran High School Post Club. And anyone who disagrees is just wrong. Unless it's Yu-Gi-Oh, in which case, I'll let it slide, I think. So now what you are all here for, is it worth watching in 2024? If you don't want to listen to my whole analysis of the show and you want to just end it here, uh, is it worth watching? Under a very specific circumstance. <laughs> Either, if you want to rewatch it because you loved it as a kid, I suppose that's understandable. But really, what it is made for is if you have, like preschoolers that you are watching, either as like a a babysitter, or if you have a niece or nephew, or if you have your own kids, or I guess grandkids based off of my demographic, or perhaps it is you, 
because I know that most of my fan base is lying about their age. Thank you to those of you who post under my comments, under my videos that say 18 plus and say, 18 plus, I'm nine. So maybe this show is for you, but this was definitely TVY7. And that is, that is who it is meant for. And it has enough jokes that if you are the adult watching with somebody, some, some child who should definitely get Copics merch, by the way, then it makes sense for watching that. But that, that is like the only circumstance. Now again, maybe Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds or GX is worth watching. Maybe it is coked out of its mind even more. And that's really what I've been hearing is that GX is good. And Little Karibo, uh, the godfather of all abridged series, making Yu-Gi-Oh! the abridged series, which I'll get to a little bit later, you know, they said that Yu-Gi-Oh! GX 5Ds is really worth watching. So I might give that a watch if you leave a comment and let me know. Maybe if you at me on Twitter, not that I'm ever using platform formerly known as Twitter. So Yu-Gi-Oh! What is it about? Yu-Gi-Oh! is a show about friendship. Uh, it, is, it is about overcoming your flaws thanks to those of you around you and having a positive influence. And by them helping you, you in turn are also helping them. And there are also other things to, to have been learned, you know, on a, a seasonal basis and stuff like that. But the overarching theme is friendship and the joke that is told about this show, whether it's the abridged series or just by anyone who's ever watched it. Friendship! That is, that is what it is. That is, that is the show. That is the show. My first experience of this show, besides like little like ads here and there, were, was, in fact, the Abridged series by Little Karibo. And rarely ever do I say that you can skip the show and watch just the Abridged series, but Little Karibo's Abridged series to this, you can absolutely watch it. It is actually a better version of the show itself. Uh, there, you really don't lose much context. I watched the abridged series, then I watched Yu-Gi-Oh! The Show, and then I watched it again just to see if there was any sort of jokes that I would get. And there were a few. There were absolutely a few, but there were a whole lot more jokes. If you go watch, like, Dragon Ball abridged and all the other abridged series that were going on at that time and how they interacted with each other. I quote the show all the time, just because of how wacky some of the lines are. Monsters! Real monsters! I just go, real blank, real ghost energy drink, real dual disc, real fake dual disc. Let's dive into the show as a whole. I was not planning to make this video, uh, if that wasn't clear. Uh, I, there is very little scripting. The only scripting I have is that there are 224 episodes, and honestly, the show itself overall is a lot like watching the previous Super Bowl in that nobody really cared who won until the ending, which I will get to. I will get to, I won't spoil it too far. There will be spoilers in this though, because the show is like 24 years old. What the flip, man? You should watch it by now or don't. Okay, that's, I'm getting very off track and contradicting myself, and that's no good. But basically, Yu-Gi-Oh! feels like you're watching a bunch of people play this game, but you obviously already know who's gonna win. The stakes aren't very high, in my opinion. Even though there are such significant stakes, it just doesn't feel like it, because you know that Yu-Gi's gonna win all the time, because Yu-Gi is like the only one that you, is the one that you see play the most, and he doesn't lose, except for like one time, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Hey, this is definitely not a take two of me coming down off of a Benzo Fury High. So basically, season one is about very flamboyant, purple, pink haired. Wait, no, he wears pink. Season one is about a billionaire who invented the game Duel Monsters, which is the game Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's the, the universe and the universe it can't be called Yu-Gi-Oh! because that would be weird. So what he's doing is he uh, was a happy man until he got married. <laughs> and then his wife died. She done exploded, which is very sad. If I say anything objectionable at all during this video, uh, just pretend that it's right. And so after his wife done exploded, he was obviously grief-stricken. And so as a grief-stricken man, he did what any normal, sane, human being would do, 
and he went to Egypt. And so, backstory, backstory, he uh, ends up creating dual monsters, getting a Millennium Eye, which allows him to see into people's minds. He gets that, but then he realizes that the Millennium Eye will not be able to bring his wife back alone. He doesn't really know how to bring his wife back, but his theory is get all of the Millennium items together and hopefully that will be able to get him to bring her back, possibly, or find a way to do so. If you want to know the the effects of each Millennium item, which I'm sure you do, the Millennium Pendant, or the, the, the Millennium Puzzle, contains the soul of the Pharaoh. It has the ability to summon dual monsters, including the Egyptian gods, which I didn't realize was a requirement of the Millennium Puzzle, considering that Kaiba can do it. And it also grants the one who solves it mastery of all games and the power of darkness, which I assume the power of darkness is power of the shadow realm. So he could create a shadow game. Um, but apparently the reason why Yugi is good at everything, and this would have been good to know, except it would have just confirmed everybody's theories, uh, that Yugi just wins everything. Like he can't lose. I guess. The Millennium Eye is able to read minds, look into a person's soul, and it can seal souls inside of cards, which is very specific, and it grants the wielder visions of the dead, which I, I guess that's kind of fun. The Millennium Ring allows its owner to find whatever he seeks, acting like a compass, like the Jack Sparrow compass, I guess. It also seals souls and fragments of souls into objects, so you can... It's it's kind of like it's kind of like the Millennium Eye, but a little bit more on steroids. You know, you buy the Millennium Eye and then you save up to buy the ring. And it also contains the souls of Zork and the thief Bakura. So I didn't realize that the soul of Zork was stuck in the ring. The Millennium Scale, which is something that's only seen in the flashbacks in season five. Uh, let's the user weigh the darkness of a person's heart, and it allows them to fuse monsters in ancient Egypt. I can tell why they didn't actually make a whole season with it involved. All right, cool. The Millennium Key, owned by Shadi, uh, lets the holder enter a person's mind, and it allows the wielder to redecorate the soul to make anyone their puppet. Then there's the Millennium Rod, which allows you to also do mind control, but it also seals Egyptian spirit monsters inside of the tablets in season five. So you were, you were required to have that. And the Millennium Necklace uh, lets you see into the past and see into the future. So when I talk about this later, it, uh, you can actually see the past. And the, and the future. If this sounds confusing to you, that's because I am like 99% sure that his reasoning was not created until we got to the final battle and then they had to come up with something. So this is, that that is the backstory that they came up with, a reason why he's actually a good guy. He's just sad, guys. He's just sad. Uh, officer, I'm sorry that I just ran over all those people in my 2006 Mustang, but honestly, I was just sad. In fact, I have the big sad, so do you think it would be okay if I went and did it again? So anyway, that is all backstory to the reason why Yugi is even here. Now, what's cool about Duelist Kingdom is that Yugi is the best player at his school, but he's by no means the best player in the world, or so that's what we are led to believe. So he would never join a international world's greatest dual monsters championship ever without a little bit of incentive. So after he fights Kaiba simply because Kaiba wanted a blue eyes white dragon card, there are three of them in existence. No, there are four of them in existence. Kaiba has three and you're only allowed to have three copies of one card in your deck, except for some cards where you're only allowed to have like two or one or none, but you're allowed to have three blue eyes white dragons because you can special summon it. Uh, actually, no, you get three of them out, fuse and then fusion you can them then to fusion them to fusion summon Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. I played the game three times, I think. Kaiba shows up to Yugi's grandpa's house. Now, Yugi's grandpa is a creep. The end. Now you know his entire story. Uh, 
but Yugi's grandpa's sweet old man who's just a little bit very pervy, and he happens to have the last copy of Blue Eyes White Dragon, and Kaiba wants it so that it can't be used against him. So Kaiba tries to buy it and then kidnaps Yugi's grandpa to get the card, and then after all this, Kaiba just rips up the card that so that that last Blue Eyes White Dragon could never be used against him, which is very, very something indeed. You know, not just keeping it, you know, maybe one gets destroyed or something like that. Yeah, no, nope, we just, we're gonna rip it. So during that fight, somehow, uh, Palpatine returns. Pegasus figures out about the battle and it's not explained even at the end, but you're led to assume that somehow he found out about that fight because Kaiba was the greatest duelist in the world and he lost to a guy wearing a very suspicious m Millennium Puzzle. It's not on this sweater. Do you like the sweater, by the way? I know I've pointed it out before. I spent $69.420 on it. In order to get Yugi, who has Millennium Puzzle, which Pegasus kinda maybe sorta needs, asterisk, Pegasus challenges Yugi to a shadow game using the TV, where he sucks him into the TV, sort of, and they play a game, and then Yugi is about to win, but there was a time limit on this so that, you know, you could actually have the fight later, which makes sense, except it doesn't. So the entire season is really comprised of you meet all these characters, you fight them, blah, blah, blah. And it's actually probably the most interesting season because there's not like this huge, um, you know, behind the scenes evil entity, which we will get to later. It is just a tournament arc with a reason to go. Uh, it's very bare bones. It, it, that's kind of what's, what's fun about it. Eventually, uh, Kaiba shows up. Kaiba's having his company get taken over by Pegasus while this is all happening because Pegasus needs Kaiba's technology again for kind of an unexplored reason. Kaiba tries to get his company back from Pegasus by entering the tournament that he wasn't in the first place, so he kind of just jumps around. But what he needs is the final card to get in, and in order to do that, he challenges Yugi to a duel, and this is where Yugi loses. Yugi technically lost in the other one, but that's only because time ran out, and I don't think that counts at all whatsoever. Kaiba is about to lose, so then he does what any rational person would do, and he just gets up on a balcony and says, if you do this last attack, the blast will throw me off of this ledge and I will die, which he has already survived a fall from a ledge from much higher, but obviously Yugi doesn't know that. Yugi can't go through with it, so he loses the duel and uh, Kaiba goes in, he gets the card to be able to, to go through to the final round. Kaiba then eventually also loses his soul, and Mokuba loses his soul, who is his younger brother, whose entire purpose in the show is to be a damsel in distress, to just get kidnapped. There's a whole joke about it in the Abridged series about how many times he's kidnapped. It is, it is absolutely ridiculous. It is... I, I'm sure you could look it up very easily. Can I be bothered to do that? No, not really. Okay, yeah, I can. Ten anime ca characters who keep getting kidnapped over and over again. <laughs> number ten is CL. Look at that. And number three is Mokuba. Almost every other week, according to this. There's not an actual number, but yeah. According to that, almost every other week. So, the final duel happens between Pegasus and Yugi once again, and the loser has to do whatever the other one says. It is a it is a blank slate of uh, Yugi can get whatever he wants, so in this case it's releasing the souls of those three, or Pegasus gets Yugi's eternal soul, which is super duper in my opinion. I feel like that is a fair trade. Pegasus loses after like five episodes, a five episode duel happening. And thus, Grappa, Grappa Muto is saved. And, uh, and I guess so is Kaiba and other Kaiba, Kaiba Jr. And Kaiba Jr. Jr. Fun fact, Grappa Moto, spelled backwards, is Apnar Otem. I'm sure that piece of information I just gave you will not show up in season five. Anyway, I'm going to take this off because it is definitely distracting me. 
It was definitely made for children. This does not fit my arm at all. I can't believe that a children's card game, a show about a children's card game, could possibly have merch made for children. Now, season two is where we are introduced to the bad guy for the next two seasons. The bad guy for the next two seasons is related to the kickoff of, like, the actual story of, like, who is the Pharaoh? Like, we know about the... But we don't really know who he is. Now, you could take a wild guess and say that he used to be the king of Egypt at some point when monsters roamed the world, which if I... Which I'm sure I didn't explain. Dual monsters was based off of actual fights that Egyptians had thousands of years ago with actual spirit monsters, uh, and now they're cards. So anyway, that's the backstory of, of Yu-Gi-Oh. So the rare hunters, the rare hunters, are the people who are controlled by Merrick, the bad guy of this season. And Merrick is, uh, trying to find the Egyptian god cards. So, Seto just happens to put on a new tournament. Totally different from the other one, and he is not going to be participating in this one right now because he doesn't need to prove that he needs man to take care of him. And I think that's very brave of him, which really makes him the bigger man and really the uh, duelist, uh, dual monsters champion because he got to look inside of himself and realize that he was a dual monsters champion to him in his truth. All right, back on track. The God cards now exist. Uh, and so Merrick wants them so that he can have the power of the Pharaoh, which would happen somehow, I guess. I think that he would just be, if he had all three Egyptian God cards, Obelisk the Tormentor, Slifer the Sky Dragon, and the Winged Dragon of Ra, if he could control all those, he could just beat any deck and then challenge the Pharaoh to a card game and then just be like, I choose your position inside of a child. I didn't think about that, about the implications here. So that's his goal for this whole season. So this whole season happens and basically the, uh, the arc happens, the tournament arc happens. And it's all fun and games until, whoa-oh, whole season happens. Kaiba decides to get in on this action because he realizes that there are cards that are stronger than Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. And he's like, I must have those. I mean, come on, would anyone want those? So, uh, yeah, he, he does eventually join. Of course he does. We're introduced to Duke Devlin as a little bit of a filler arc. Uh, right before season two about dungeon dice monsters, which is the same thing except for with dice uh, as dual monsters. And then he sticks around for some reason. I don't know why, but he just sticks around, <laughs> which is cool. He's a cool guy, uh, but I don't know why he's part of the posse. <laughs> then Merrick and uh, bad guy who's still around called Bakura. That's the bad guy duo. And then the good guy duo is Yugi and Joey, along with the wild card of Seto being in there. And then basically to cover his tracks, Bakura has Merrick send Bakura to the Shadow Realm, and then he will eventually come out of the Shadow Realm at the very end of season five. So now there are two good guys versus one bad guy with Kaiba in the middle. But before we finish that, well, what kind of Yu-Gi-Oh would this be if we didn't instantly jump into a filler arc? So Seto and Mokuba were adopted by Mr. Kaiba, Kaiba Sr., and they were also begrudgingly adopted. But Kaiba Sr. did have a son before them who almost died, but, they, but he preserved his son, his actual biological son's consciousness to a computer because that sounds normal. Now his name is Noah. And this is easily, it was such a bad filler. It was absolutely unfun. 12 episodes of a guy who really wants to be a penguin and then a woman. Yeah, that was, that was, I'm not even joking. How many, oh no. Oh no. Okay, so 24 episodes of filler. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, wow. So Noah 
this mysterious Noah that nobody likes, he hijacks the Kaiba Corp blimp on the way to the finale, or the, the, the finals fight. And so then Noah wants all of the great duelists to come with him into a virtual reality system where if you die in the game, you die for real. Basically, they get trapped because they need to fill time. So they get trapped. Merrick doesn't do anything, even though he has a thing for stabbing people's eyes. Merrick doesn't actually end up killing anyone while they are in, like, Sword Art Online, like, frozen in time and space and... Uh, or just lying where they are and their consciousnesses are in a video game. He just kind of chills. Like, we, we cut to him, like, they cut to him, like, three times throughout the entire 24 episodes where he's just like, man, I sure can't get past this locked door. <laughs> Noah tries to, tries to get out of this simulation because, you know, he was horrifically bored by the situation and he went crazy because he realized everyone around him were literally NPCs and nothing was real. Never is. So that was super dark and also understandable, unlike most of the villains who get a pass and are redeemed somehow. So then Noah is like, I want to be a real boy and Kaiba, you're not even a real bro. You're a step bro which is actually true. And unfortunately, he does not win, and their way of escaping, uh, it only happens because Noah is like, no, I've had a change of heart, you guys are good now. And then Kaiba Sr. is like, no, I will keep you here to, because I will. Gozaburo Kaiba, that's his name. I just looked it up. Gozaburo, I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm not going to remember that. All right, I'm just going to keep calling him. <laughs> Cope Kaiba Sr. is like, actually, you guys can't leave. Even though you just beat Noah. I, it was me all along. Me, Dio. Goes the He sends a missile to destroy everything so that there's no escape from this place. But Noah sacrifices himself so that everyone can leave. And redeems himself. It's so nice. So awesome. So wholesome. Uh, hashtag wholesome. Everybody, can we get a one in the chat? wholesome wholesome one after 24 episodes of schlop we get back into the battle city tournament and that is where we are fighting Merrick Merrick has entrapped many many of our friends in the shadow realm so now what we have to do is we have to get everybody whittled down so so Joey fights and he almost wins but then he gets sent to the shadow realm and then uh, he gets struck they both get struck by lightning and the fact that Joey didn't get up means that he loses. But he almost did. He just stands there. He's so close to winning. But then he's just like, ugh, and he passes out. And uh, that for, therefore, Merrick wins. And after that, they do a loser's bracket. So basically, Kaiba's like, I want to see who's really stronger, Yugi. And then they fight just to see who's stronger. But they didn't, they didn't have to do that, but they did it anyway. And, uh, of course, Yugi wins, because he does. And then they do a loser's bracket, because Joey is okay now. And, uh, the two of them fight each other, and I, I'll be honest, I was on i was on Facebook Marketplace for most of this show. Because that's just kind of how it was. But every once in a while, you get a, you get a fight that you actually want to see who wins. And this was one of them. We figure out that third place is going to Kaiba. So it's, it's always great. It's always great. Then it is the last fight. It is the fight where Yugi and Merrick fight each other. And it it's so cool because you definitely have no idea who's going to win. But you know what? It turns out that after a very daring duel, Yugi is in fact the winner. And then uh, everybody's happy because it turns out that, you know, Merrick wasn't actually, you know, he was a bad evil man. He was a creation of his hosts want to have friends but then it turns out that he made friends actually which is pretty cool in my opinion and um basically he's destroyed but then we get the good version of Marek which is pretty awesome and then he's he's just kind of let go which is fun season four made absolutely no sense whatsoever uh there's this 
group using something called the Orichalcos, but all I can think of is the Orichalcomalos, and that is what I will call it because it is significantly better. The Orichalcomalos is weird because basically it lets you trap the soul of the loser. If you do that, it takes the soul of the loser, traps it in a card, and that way the, the big bad of this season can use all those souls to summon a an unstoppable dragon the the big the the serpent the serpent some serpent the slithery little slithy snake so darts is the big bad guy which is definitely a name that somebody chose the great leviathan that's what it was called the great leviathan so basically he needs some souls he's been going at it for about for ten thousand years he's been collecting souls so he can summon the great leviathan so that he can have control of the world and time so that he can get his family back, which is so nice. Hashtag wholesome. Except for the fact that he's sacrificing many, 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 many souls. And I don't really understand how they figured it out. Basically, what they did is they, uh, is, uh, they sense, like, how valuable your soul is. And he's like, oh, I, I sense the Pharaoh. And so they, uh, he's going after the pharaohs! Sold, because I guess that's all he needs after 10,000 years. Is just one pharaoh soul. That was the chemical X to summon the Great Leviathan. Now in season four, in order to destroy and defeat the Great Leviathan, uh, Yugi, Joey, and Kaiba are chosen. They are chosen to wield these three mythical dragons that don't make an appearance at all in Season 5 to try to defeat Zork because they're part of the Yu-Gi-Oh! multiverse of madness. I don't know. It, it, I'm, at, least, at least this show doesn't have a multiverse. Unless it does, in which case that would really suck. But I think it's all some sort of a, a, a timeline. There's an actual timeline and there's no multiverse. That would, that would be probably the worst thing they could possibly do with this show. Apparently, the the card there's the monster realm and there's the people realm so whenever the ancient egyptians trapped monster souls inside of tablets they were just grabbing from that world and bringing it into the to ours and it's like the physical manifestation and so the great leviathan was going to destroy both worlds so then the toon world had to come into the minds of our three protagonists and say help us joey help us you help us said okay but here wield these mythical dragon guardians to save us all and uh, as soon as they they were done doing that uh, they they kind of just stopped being. Yeah, season four was was filled with a lot of like, these cards are people, you know? Like Pixar would have a heyday with that concept. Pixar, don't get any ideas, please don't. Please don't, we, no. Mm -mm. So what happens is, uh, we, he's like, oh no, we won't do the, we won't use the, the seal of Oracalcos because it's wrong. But it turns out that one of the three henchmen is like, I would never sacrifice my cards. They are my waifus. Those cards, they mean everything to me. Back when I could only say Zug Zug, they were there for me. The only possible way to win this children's card game, mind you, uh, was to play the Seal of Orichalcos. Uh, that proved him to be bad because he wanted to win, and then Yugi loses because he loses track of what's really important, that's friendship, and playing a good game that he's literally never cheated at before, ever. Remember how there's two souls in the Pharaoh's body? Well, little Yugi takes the Pharaoh's spot, and Yugi's soul is not as valuable as the Pharaoh's, which is very sad. <laughs> uh, uh, t t take the L, buddy. <laughs> now the Pharaoh is by himself for the first time since his consciousness, basically, when he was reawoken by Yugi putting the puzzle together. Now he has to go on realizing that he did, he did it, he done did a bad. And so he's going through all of this season trying to redeem himself until the episode where he has to go to the Valley of the Spirits. And he has to, he has to realize that the only way to overcome his sadness is to fight Yugi, a little spirit representation of Yugi. And uh, he does so with the help of a monk named Haru and his granddaughter and some dog named Bow Wow Schmauz Wow. And Bow Wow Schmauz Wow is probably the greatest character in this entire thing because he's ridden like a horse by this little girl uh, to help him beat Yugi 
who's like, I can't believe you sacrificed. He's really, he's not really mean. He's not a bad guy uh, in the spirit form. He's just kind of salty, which is <laughs> so much better. But eventually, through the help of his friends, the Pharaoh is able to overcome his guilt in the representation of Yugi by beating Yugi. And kind of killing him, the representation. Then we scooch, we scooch skedaddle on over to the very end of the show where he, where Pharaoh is like, Yugi's still alive and I will find him and I will beat him. So he ends up going up against darts, but not before a whole bunch of people can take a swing at him. And by this time, a lot of people have been lost to the Orichalcos. Joey has been lost. Yugi has been lost. Boobs Mackenzie has been lost. And then for some re for some reason, uh, Pegasus is also there. Uh, and so in order to defeat darts, the Pharaoh and his nemesis now friend, colleague Kaiba, are now fighting as a team to beat darts and the power of friendship. They are eventually able over all odds to defeat him. Although this season is, I think, is that the one is this the season where you get the weird dragon cards? So in order to defeat this great leviathan, uh, we have three new uh, dragons. Uh, and of course, the dragons choose the pharaoh, Kaiba, and Joey. Real monsters! To wield them, much like a wand chooses a wizard, these dragons who are super dragon these nuts. So these dragons are super... Uh, effective, except for in the final season. Throughout this show, there's been that these cards that are are deemed the way that we're going to destroy the great Leviathan, and that is why Kaiba and Yugi come together to summon all of their most powerful cards, including these brand new Deus Ex Machina dragons. And guess what? They win. Which is pretty pog, in my opinion. So anyway, after that whole season, that was a big old schlog. Let's go to the next season that starts with a filler arc. And the filler arc is another tournament arc. This really didn't make any sense to me. So basically, you think that there's another, there's literally a carbon copy of Pegasus, and he's the new bad guy trying to take over Kaiba Corp. They have the same picture. And buy all the stocks, 50% uh, plus one, you know, 51% of Kaiba Corp. But then it turns out it wasn't that guy. It was his younger brother, which is so crazy. Except for, you know, it, it, I really I really didn't understand that. If I'm being honest, I really didn't understand any of that. Any of that arc, I don't know what it served to the story, but it, it sure did happen. Something else that was incredibly unbearable was uh, in the middle of season five. Um, apparently this is not canon, which I, I okay. I knew it wasn't canon because it was a four kids exclusive from what I'm able to gather. It is a four kids exclusive to help the Japanese like actual show catch up to them. So there was a whole 12 episode arc that meant absolutely nothing whatsoever called Capsule Monsters. Like if Yu-Gi-Oh wasn't already close enough to Pokemon, this was just this was just straight up Pokemon ripoff. Um, on Hulu, this is counted as being part of the show, which means that I had to keep watching, and I didn't realize until afterwards that it was completely and totally pointless. This was the worst thing since unsliced bread. It brought the episode count up to 236, baby. I, I was so upset that I had to watch this. This was such an upsetting series of, of episodes. Uh, it was very boring and meant nothing, and I was so close to the end, but it was like, nope, have another filler arc. Uh, but uh, it's still better than Twilight, so. Which is why I was super happy to realize that uh, the uh, that uh, Bakura is is now back in the story, and turns out that Bakura is now trying to get the ultimate evil, the embodiment of the Shadow Realm, called Zork. Now Zork is certainly is mine in it, and Zork is certainly uh, is a big bad guy. Uh, later on in the season, they throw the book at him. They, they throw Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. They throw Exodia. They throw Inverse Shadow Exodia, that I forget the name of. They throw all three Egyptian God cards. They all die horrifically. 
and uh, barely make a dent on him, which is <laughs> so weird that like eventually they win with just like pure friendship, singing Kumbaya and stuff like that. But basically, we we go from this weird tournament arc that has absolutely nothing to do with anything, right into the past, and the and we get like this whole thing of characters that we see the that we've known the counterparts to them from the future. We just get to see them for quite a few episodes in the past to get the backstory of everybody and how they're about to come together. And we get to find out, was Pharaoh a good king? That's all we've been wanting to know. Was the Pharaoh a good Pharaoh? And turns out, yes-ish. It's about, it's about exactly what you expected in the beginning of this video. Yeah, he was, he was good-ish. Like, he's not, like, throwing money at people, but... You know, he's, he's not whipping people either, so... In my book, he's not whipping the Jews, so I'm happy. So now we find out that uh, the way that Bakura is coming into this world is that Seto's actual father, who they didn't say was his father for some reason, super secret, uh, actually wanted... Kaiba to become the pharaoh, so he plots against the Yugi pharaoh named Atem. So the Yugi pharaoh uh, is like, no, how could you do this? And uh, Kaiba is like, no, how could you do this, father? And then he's all angry and blah! And so basically, uh, uh, through through power of sadness and disdain and the shadow verse, uh, the, the shadow realm is able to open up and the dark one cometh. And so Zork is unstoppable unbelievable unstoppable cuz he's unstoppable and so they end up fighting zork and eventually through the power of friendship past and present and present past the present past we're finally able to defeat zork now zork it still is it still is mind-boggling what they did like I said to show how tough he was was they threw like every single powerful entity at him at once and turns out what you really needed to do was create just a giant snickle loaf just mash them all together and then just like there you go and that's how you did it because it was sugar-coated in friendship and held together with the binds of friendship and the friendship was friendly the end Except for it's not. You'd think that was the end, wasn't it? But no, we have to have an epilogue. And this is the only, one of the only duels that I actually cared about and wanted to see happen. The final duel is between Yugi and the Pharaoh. If Yugi loses, then the Pharaoh gets to stay with him until he grows to become an even more mature person and duelist. But if Yugi wins, and it proves that he's learned everything that he can from the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh can move on and stop being <laughs> around for all these years. He gets to just move on to the afterlife. What's gonna happen? Because you can see, like, the Pharaoh staying so that they can make more episodes, or you can fill in, you know, more things that are gonna happen with, with the group. But you also want to see that Yugi actually did grow and become a better person because of his friends, because of the Pharaoh, who we've all grown very attached to at this point. One of the few characters that everyone actually cared about, but at the end, at the very end of the show, Yugi does end up defeating Atem. They could not, like, hold back. It wasn't, like, an easy thing. They weren't allowed to, you know, because apparently the, the spirit world would know, you know. <laughs> but eventually, Yugi well and truly defeats Atem at Duel Monsters. <laughs> Which means that he can go. If it was any other game, if it was Sorry Sliders, hell no, 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 not gonna fly, Bucko. But this game, <laughs> he's he's actually able to win, and it's like the actual one of the only duels that was actually worth watching, and uh, it was a good one to end on. And uh, after all that, after 224 episodes, like I said. The show was certainly a show that happened. So my overall thoughts and opinions on Yu-Gi-Oh! the original series is that it is a fine show. It definitely is incredibly memeable and quotable. Um, it definitely sparked a generation 
It is not something that I watched as a kid, so I do not have a special attachment to it like a lot of other people do. My rating of Yu-Gi-Oh! personally, on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of quality, I always do two. I have quality and I have entertainment because I feel like it's not really fair. Like the Joker movie from 2019 with Joaquin Phoenix, as a quality movie, that was like a 9 out of 10 in terms of quality. But in terms of entertainment, it was like a 5. Like it was not exactly entertaining to watch. That's not what it was meant to be, but that that's why I have two categories. On a scale from 1 to 10, I think in terms of quality, it is probably uh, 5. And in terms of entertainment, it, it fluctuates. Some days it is a 2, and some days it is a 9. And y you never really know. It depends on what Joey Wheeler is saying that day, or if Kaiba is in the episode. But thank you all so much for watching this incredibly low effort, uh, no scripting whatsoever, spewage of knowledge. My ideas here, now. I talked, I said things completely unscripted. Uh, this, if you're looking for some sort of like in-depth analysis, uh, just go to Evan Prince or something. I mean, he, he doesn't really do shows, but I mean, it, it's not me. This is completely uh, low effort. Um, I don't even know why you're still watching, but you are, so thank you. Anyway, I've rambled on for long enough, and I will see all of you in the next duel. An incorrect summary by Maxor. <laughs>